Shalom, aloha. I'm here to talk about the Torah story coming up tomorrow for Shabbat, and it's called Pinchas. And as you know, Parsha means portion. So this is this is the title of this video. Parsha Pinchas means we're at the portion called Pinchas in the Torah. So last week um, we spoke about Balak and Balaam, and this week we're going to talk about Pinchas. This Parsha is so complex, and there's so much in it. There are so many messages. It's so deep. I encourage you to explore deeper after this video to share insights that you come across or that, that are conjured up within your own being um, because there's just so much to talk about with this one. But I'm only going to talk about a few points that I think are super important and that are, are easy to kind of focus in on rather than trying to get it all done in a short amount of time. You can do that in your own time. You have all of Shabbat to be in this message, to study it, and then to carry it with you throughout the week. So go as deep as you'd like. The main point of Pinchas is this idea that he killed, he killed this couple. I'm just going to flat out say it, okay? This is like a very controversial portion. And I think the main reason why it's so controversial is because a lot of people forget that it's, it's a metaphor, it's all a metaphor and there is no separation. So when we see these stories from the eyes of oneness, then the truth becomes more clear and we can kind of get out of our ego mind and receive the truth of what's, what's being shared in the story. So the, in other words, this couple that was killed by Pinchas and Pinchas himself, they're all one being, they're all parts of one consciousness. And so the couple in the story who he killed were representing the evil inclination within the one nation. So Pinchas, him killing this couple, was really a metaphor for, for the one killing the evil inclination within the whole. And so the couple um, that he killed for doing this sin, um, they basically represented the destruction of family purity. There was a war going on. And it was known that the, the fastest and best way to destroy a nation was to destroy the family purity, to break up the family. And so that was, without getting into too much detail, that was sort of what was going on with this couple and the uh, sinful act that they were committing. And then Pinchas, without a thought of, you know, of, of his own punishment, of consequences that would come upon him, he immediately just took care of business, okay? It seems really gruesome, like he murdered this couple, but you have to see it as a metaphor. And I think it's for this reason that a lot of people actually miss out on some profound truths within not just the Torah, but many ancient sacred texts, because it's metaphorical and we want to look at it from such a, like a literal viewpoint. But in the end, it doesn't matter if it really happened or not. It's about here and now, what the message is in the story and what we can take from it and, and apply to our lives here and now. And so when we look from the eyes of oneness, it allows us to extract a timeless perspective or a timelessly applicable lesson. So when we see any of these stories as though all the characters are just different aspects of our own self, or our own mind, then we really make progress. Then we really extract something from the story that we can use. So what is that usable message here? Pinchas was this, this entire aspect of the one being who then, without worry or consideration of consequences, did what he felt in his entire being to be right. And he wiped out that evil inclination right then and there. And because of that, he saved the nation and he was blessed. He became blessed for this act that he did. And so at first you want to see it and you want to go, oh my goodness, well, it's murder. Like, of course of course, like this is just wrong, right? Especially because the Torah promotes life, right? L'chaim. Life is, is the most important, most precious thing. And so it's said, it's known that you can actually commit a sin if it's going to save life. But here, it's like really makes us look deeper because it's like, well, he, he killed two beings, not just one, but two. And it's like, of course he's wrong, but then why did God bless him? And whenever there's this sort of like a, a really confusing point in the Torah or like a controversial point, it's just asking us to 
look closer. It's asking us to open up our hearts and our minds more to be able to see the hidden message. So often what you, what you think upon first hearing the story is not true. You have to look deeper. You want to immediately say, how could Pinchas be awarded for this, uh, be rewarded for this? He, he committed a sin. But if you look at the bigger picture of things and if you look at everything as one, what was really happening there was he was prioritizing the life of the one, which meant future generations and the purity of the womb that's carrying those future generations. And so essentially it was a sacrifice of those lives that in the end was going to save many more lives. So it's about not just life, but life as a whole life as an interconnected whole, which we're all a part. So this Parsha is meant to be so controversial and confusing, and it's really meant to make you question. The confusion serves a purpose. It helps you go deeper. And on that note, I want to talk about a few funny things about this Parsha that follow that sort of pattern of like, huh? Or how could this be? This is breaking a rule. But again, each of these points is just asking us to look closer. So let's talk about some of those things. One of the things in this Parsha is the broken letter Vav in the word Shalom, peace. And in the Torah, it said there cannot be one broken letter. There cannot be a crack in any of the letters. It has to be absolutely perfect in order for the light to flow. It's a code. The Torah is a code. And this is why it's overseen by multiple rabbis, multiple men, so that they, they make sure there's this checks and balances to make sure that the Torah is kosher, that the, the Torah is going to work, that the light will flow. But here in this Parsha, we have a few exceptions, one of them being an actual broken letter. And so you want to be like, whoa, what is that? That can't be. This is not kosher. But it helps you to stop, to pause, to look deeper. And the message of the broken Vav, the letter Vav in Shalom, is saying that it's up to us to create peace. If it was already perfect, there would be nothing to fix. So that imperfection is offering us an opportunity to step in and infuse it with our light and repair it. And I, I was just speaking about this with someone yesterday. There is a word, and you guys may have seen it because I think this like meme went viral about it. Um, there's a word um, in Japanese culture for when a vessel is cracked and you fill it with gold. And then, so the idea... And there, there are words for this in different cultures across the world. The idea is that when something's broken, that's where the light enters. Where there's something broken, there's an opportunity for us to come in and fix it, to repair it, and make it better than it ever was. So within the brokenness is the potential to rise higher. And that's essentially the whole idea of this Parsha, of Pinchas, is like, yes, there is sin. Yes, there is vice. But within that is the potential to rise higher than if there was never that challenge. Also, with that broken Vav in the word Shalom, Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it represents the spine of man. So it's further saying it's up to us. That's our sacred duty. It's what we're here to direct our, our kundalini, our shekinah, our life force energy that rests in the spine. And that's why we're here, to direct that toward the highest good, to create shalom, to fix where there isn't any peace, to bring peace where there isn't any. Also a little tarot fun because, you know, I love to connect tarot to Torah because they are one. The sixth arcanum, Arcanum six is called the lovers, also known in ancient Egypt as the two paths. It's about challenge. It's about a crossroads. And the card that follows is seven, the chariot, AKA the conqueror, the Merkava. And that's about ascension. So what this is showing us here with the broken Vav and Shalom is saying, hey, remember the challenge is here so that we can transcend it and rise ever higher. <clears throat> <clears throat> there's a few more here I want to talk about. There's a space in this parsha after the word plague. And so at first, at first glance, you're like, well, there's a space there. This is not kosher. Again, it must be a mistake. But because we're so aware of the underlying theme of this entire portion in the Torah, we know better and we know to look more closely. <clears throat> and the space after the word plague is giving us an opportunity to stop it. Again, it's inserting a space for us to enter and shift what is to come for us to affect what is happening um 
we have this opportunity to affect what is happening when we direct our will consciously. There's also a small shrunken yud, letter yud, in the name Pinchas. And what this is representing is the humility and the, the, um, the shrinking of the ego. So because Pinchas had the smaller yud in his name, it was signifying his ability to set his ego aside to be able to prioritize light, to be able to do whatever he needs to do in the name of the light without his ego getting in the way and causing confusion. For example, if the yud was bigger and you know he had a bigger ego, that, that say his name didn't have that shrunken yud, it would represent this truth that he actually has a big ego. And then he may not have killed the couple who was committing this sin and none of this would have ever happened because he would have his own mind would have gotten the way oh well you're going to be punished for this oh well you know you can't kill because if you take life that's the greatest sin so because he his ego was his ego was small because he didn't have that the ego in the way he didn't even think twice he just did it he didn't have that judgment that we have upon him where we're like, oh my God, you, how could you do this? How could you kill? He didn't even think of that. He didn't even think of that. And that kind of dedication and focus was what was necessary for him to carry out his soul's mission, which brought us the story Pinchas, which brings us his lesson still today. He had to do it. He was the one to do it because anyone else with their huge ego would have hesitated, would have doubted, would have been confused, wouldn't understand such a controversial mission. So the understanding, the logic had to be removed entirely. And the logic is, is the ego. It's the thinking mind that had to be removed. He had to be so connected to source. And in order to do that, his ego needed to be diminished. And that's why there's a smaller yud in his name. You don't see things like this in the Torah unless it's for a reason. They're breadcrumbs. A couple of other really cool things in this Parsha. Um, in this Parsha, it's, uh, it has a listing of all the year's holidays. And why would they do that? Why would they, in an already complex Parsha, now go into all this, now include all of the holidays? It's, what it's doing is giving us a chance to tap in now to those holidays and enhance them. It's sort of like, if you know Reiki, there's a symbol called Hon Chaze Shonen. And it's sending energy across time and space. So you can send energy to the past or the future. And this is a beautiful metaphysical concept that you can access every day in so many ways. Super empowering. You basically want to see, if you're sending into the future, you want to see yourself sending energy to that future moment. Like say you have a job interview. You want to see yourself there, send the energy to that future moment. And it's like a battery power that you, an extra battery power that you tap into upon arriving to that moment in the future. <clears throat> So what we're doing with this Parsha, we're hearing all the holidays and we're imbuing them with this, <clears throat> this extra healing power. <clears throat> because again, this Parsha is all about healing and protection from evil and doing whatever we have to do to prioritize the light. So we're imbuing the energy into these high holy days that are to come, just elevating them and removing whatever darkness, you know, we can even imagine would be to come. We're removing it right now. It's just an extra support. We're saying we're going to use the power of Pinchas, this, this amazing power of this Parsha, and we're going to give a little bit to each of the most important days of the year so that we're really making the most of this healing portion, the most of this healing wisdom, and just adding a little bit of that to each of these holidays. And every year we do this. So every year this ritual helps to grow the power of these holy days or rituals that we inevitably perform again and again. And then the final thing I wanted to share was the mention of the 12 tribes and zodiac signs in this Parsha. What we're doing here in this Parsha of going over the 12 tribes and zodiac signs is we're em empowering the higher qualities of each of those archetypes within us here now, just like with the holidays. We're doing the same thing with these zodiac signs or tribes, which are representing parts of our own psyche and parts of ourself. So we're just taking, again, we're taking this extra power and this extra conviction and, and this, this, uh, this frequency that's devoid of ego, right? Like the small Yud in Pinchas name. We're taking this holy frequency where in this moment we're devoid of the ego and we're going to imbue each of the 12 tribes, each of the 12 signs, all of the holidays, 
with this extra power while we're in it so that we could capitalize on it and, and, and make the most of this. Really take advantage of this holy moments, holy Shabbos, Pinchas. And what that does also is it helps to push out the negative aspects of each of those archetypes of the tribes and the zodiac signs. As we fill those signs with the light, it gives power to their higher qualities and simultaneously pushes out what would have otherwise empowered the lower qualities. There's no space for both. Uh, there's a beautiful concept um, in Native American culture that I was reading about called the whirling rainbow. And this is how you, this is the concept of imbuing something with positive energy and light into, and then like in right into the darkness and it swirls the darkness around until the darkness is literally washed out. A whirling rainbow, it's so cool, right? And so that's kind of how I see this concept here as we imbue the 12 signs with this, uh, this humility which is the greatest power, right? As we imbue these, these signs, which are aspects of us, with this, the power of humility, completely um, not having any amount of ego in it, just pure humility, then we're just strengthening each of those parts and we're making it so that there's no space for the lower instincts or for the lower qualities of those archetypes to be formed. Okay, so that's how we're capitalizing on this lesson right now, the lesson of, of Pinchas. The whole idea is that sometimes we have to break the rules. Sometimes our ego gets in the way and it tells us that what we're doing is right and that we shouldn't break the rules because da 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 da, da X, Y, or Z, whatever. But the ego is actually getting confused in all the headiness and all the, the, the logic and the overthinking. And then we end up missing opportunities for miracles. And what happens is we end up supporting evil. We end up supporting the unfolding of evil in our society when we're so focused on the rules and not breaking them, we forget about the bigger picture. And it requires an extreme sense of humility to be able to prioritize the light and from that place break the rules in a way that's for the most high. We can't just say, we can't decide, oh, I'm just going to break this rule because I know it's what's best for the one. When we end up breaking the rule for a higher purpose, let it be God's will moving through you. Let it be because you are so humble. You're not overthinking things. You're not acting like you're the boss. You're not acting like the ego is in charge. And so God has the opportunity then to enter and do whatever needs to be done, even if from our own eyes or the eyes of those around us, it looks as though we're committing a sin or we're doing something wrong. Well, if we're moving from that space of humility, and purity and prioritizing God and oneness, goodness, then it can never be wrong. Then ironically, as wrong as it looks, paradoxically, as long as it, as wrong as it looks coming out of us, it's right. It's not up to us to decide when to break the rules, but it is up to the creator, the creator's will moving through us, knowing in those moments when it's important to act without hesitation of the ego, because it's in that moment where the potential for the miracle lies. And we need to have the, the humility to be able to open up for God to move through us and do it in a way that is fully righteous. <clears throat> so something that you can do for this Shabbos Pinchas, for this, uh, this Shabbat tomorrow, is you can focus on this message, understand that purity and your dedication to your path and your dedication to embodying and expressing truth is absolute priority. Don't be fooled by your temptations and also don't be fooled by, by the rules of others. You got to tune into your own heart. Something that would be a really good practice, um, especially if you're into astrology, would be to write down all of the 12 zodiac signs and ask yourself how you embody each of those signs. What qualities do you embody and how do you maybe embody them also in the dark sometimes? And how can you right now declare that in this space of the removed ego, you're going to feed that which is only the light side of the spectrum of each of those archetypes that you're declaring that without without ego now I can see the truth and I'm imbuing each of these archetypes each of these aspects of myself with that truth and then what happens is when we imbue all of them with that truth and we remove the in evil inclination from each of those archetypes we rise above all 12 to the 13th 
which is ahava, love. Love is above all. It is all. So we can transcend, transcend the 12 to the 13th, and this is how we do it. So this is just one exercise you can do. You can also consider the 12 tribes of Israel. You can also look at the different holy days that are mentioned in this Parsha and send your love and your light to those days this year. You can do this in your own way as well. If you know nothing about the, the Jewish holidays, but you have a day that's special to, to you, or you have a day that's coming up soon, or maybe in the future of this year, that is a powerful day, you can use the energy of this day to, to empower those days in the future. Again, it's that spiritual battery, that energetic battery that you're charging up for the future. So what days are power days for you this year? What days are holidays for you, special moments that are upcoming? And how can you right now send this energy there? Maybe there are challenging times up, upcoming. And how can you send the, the, the strength, the strength from this Parsha and the healing and the protection of this Parsha to those days to ensure that your ego doesn't come out to play? and that you remain humble. So again, you guys, this is Parsha Pinchas. Um, you can search this private page, our Shabbat crew page. There's an option to search the page for keywords. If I believe it's like the top right corner of the page. If you search Pinchas, P-I-N-C-H-A-S, the title of this video, you will see some articles that I shared last year uh, that you may enjoy. I think I'll share some of them again as soon as I end this video and maybe some new sources as well, so that you can begin to prepare for Shabbat, which is tomorrow night, 18 minutes before sundown. I'll be lighting the candles, and yes, I will go live so that you can hear the blessing if you'd like to receive it. Thanks so much for joining me for this Parsha, Parsha Pinchas, and if you have anything to share about what you receive from the story, or as you study, if something comes up that you find interesting, please share it with us. That is why we have this special group, Shabbat crew. Okay. Shalom, everybody. I'll see you for the activation uh, in about five minutes or so. I'm going to go live on my main page for the final quarter activation, so I'll see you then.